and minimalists. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. We got a special guest today. Indeed, we do. Professional oh. baseball player James Clear. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is that a baseball player? No, no. Oh. It, no, it's not. He, uh, he, he had a brief stint with baseball. Uh-huh. He talks about it like in the very beginning of his, his amazing book. Um, yeah, no, he's not a professional baseball player, but he looks like one for sure. All right, well, well this is episode <laughs> 165 and it's coming out on new year's day and so what better time to talk about habits of course yeah you can listen to this any time of the year because it's always a good time to talk about reconsidering your habits but this is the time of year james that people really i guess reflect back on all the bad decisions they've made over the course <laughs> of the last 12 months or 37 years in my case mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and we look back and say i need to i need to change this right I, i've developed a routine that is not beneficial that is not that is not advantageous for living the life that i want to live and so we have today james clear he's he is the author of this amazing book atomic habits yeah. and james we don't really interview people but i did have a question for you before we dive into some of these questions how did you become the habits guy? What? what how did all of this happen? Oh, man. Well, good to talk to you both. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, dude. Thanks um, for being here, man. We really appreciate it. So, uh, I mean, everybody has habits, right? Like, mm-hmm. you're building them all the time, whether you want to or not. So, uh, I felt like it made sense to um, think more carefully about how that happens and, like, can we design them rather than have them happen to us. And my first exposure to it was what Ryan mentioned. It was through baseball and sports. Mm-hmm. You know, like any athlete can tell you there are all kinds of habits you're building when mm-hmm. you're at practice or, you know, uh, in the gym or things like that. And so I got exposed to it there. And then I've spent the last six years just kind of like writing about the ideas and sharing them on my site and uh, gradually narrowing in on what I think it takes to build good habits and break bad ones. So, so you've been blogging over at jamesclear.com. Correct. And, uh, and, and, and sort of, I guess, refining your ideas about what it takes to, to build good habits, replace bad habits. And I think really that's what a lot of our questions that we have today from our audience are. Mm-hmm. So I think we should just go ahead and dive in and start answering some of these questions. Yeah. Um, well, let's just talk about his book real quick. And about how awesome his book is. Okay. <laughs> um, I just, you know, before we dive into the questions, I do just want to say that uh, James sent me an email. I was like, hey, man, I wrote a new book. Would love uh, to send you a copy. Um, like like any good friend, yes, yeah, send me a copy of your book. I r- dove into like the first chapter and I was like, oh, my God, like this, this is one of the best books I've ever read on habits. Like we've got to get him on the podcast. But I went out and I bought uh, at least two copies and I sent one to my mom. I sent one to my brother. Uh, because it is such a, it's just a simple approach, man. And I think with any type of nonfiction, especially like a, I don't want to call you your genre of self-help, but I can't think of anything else right now, but it, it is a sort of self-help. Josh and I too are, are, are in, you know, sort of that realm as well, but for sure. I, in fact, I've, I've sort of reclaimed the, the, the positive side of, uh, of that because for me is like, of course I want to help myself. Sure. Like, <laughs> and if I can help others by expressing how I help myself, the, the problem with, with the, the, the sort of moniker of, of self help is, is there's a lot of vapid woo woo, mm-hmm. uh, uh, nonsense out there. Mm-hmm. And, and the difference about what, what you're talking about, in fact, you even, you, you have it right here on the cover is like, it's, it's a proven way of, of, uh, of reflecting back on bad habits and, and making the positive changes that, that you want to make. Yeah, yeah, I want like all of my ideas should be scientifically based. So I feel like yeah. that's the difference between traditional self-help and uh, the type of stuff I write. But to I Ryan's totally point <clears throat> uh, and to your point about um, you want to be able to help yourself, I think the idea should not just be scientific, but also actionable. Yeah. Right. And that that's the key is like, I want to have something I can actually apply in it, daily life. That is what I really liked about your book, dude, is that it it's simple advice and it's simple steps. It's not like this grand, it, like I didn't finish this book feeling um, like, oh my God, I got so much work ahead of me. Mm. Like I finished this book. I was like, oh my God, like. It's not as hard as I really, th- like when, when I look at it through your lens, uh, incorporating good habits into my life or changing bad ones really isn't as difficult. If anything, I was like, I got to go through this book again because there are so many like, I, I just, I'm just going to like open up to a couple of things that I underline here, man. But like you've got just tweetable, li- tweetable line after tweetable line in here. Over the long run, however, the real reason you fail to stick with habits is that your self image gets in the way. This is why you can't get too attached to one version of your identity. It's so true, dude. It's like, I mean, going back to your example with uh, being a baseball player, if you, uh, you know, you you went through your 
uh, uh, high school, college, you're, you're playing baseball. If you expected to be a professional baseball player and all of a sudden you realize like, oh, this isn't going to happen for me. And you were so wrapped up into that identity. You may have never written this book. Mm. And it's just like little stuff like that, that I, I'm reading through this book and I'm like, oh my God. Like I remember tweet as soon as I got a copy of the book, dude, like I started tweeting <laughs> some lines from it because it was, it was really incredible. But the other thing too, I like about this book is at the end of each chapter, you got little oh, highlights yeah, the summaries. Yeah, dude, it, it's, it's such a good idea because there will be um, like, there was something I was referencing and I forgot what chapter it was in. And I was like, oh, I just go to the summaries. And sure enough, like found what I was looking for because of the summary. And I uh, that's that, great. that was a nice little touch too, man. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I think uh, my hope is that the ideas will be scientifically grounded, but also easy to understand. And it sounds like it landed that way with you. Yeah, and I, I look at people like, you know, if Richard Feynman can write about physics or Stephen Hawking can write about the origin of the universe and their books can be fairly easy to read. It's like nobody else has an excuse, right? Like that the job of a writer is to make it digestible and easy to use. Yeah. And so I like looking at examples like that to yeah. try to inspire me to write in a better way. I, uh, I teach a writing class. And one of the things that I, I try to explain to, to students is um, there is a difference between communicative writing and expressive writing. Like a calculus textbook is just communicative mm -hmm. and it can be all grounded in all the science, but it's also boring as shit. And like, you don't <laughs> want to take, you don't want to take the, uh, the calculus textbook to the beach or even to the airport and read it on, on the plane. Uh, expressive writing on the other hand, like extreme expression is, um, you know, a, a, a manic person running down the middle of the street, just yelling at, it requires traffic. Yeah. It requires there's no audience whatsoever, right? Yeah. And, and and I think the beauty of, of blending the communication, actually communicating something, but doing it in a way that is expressive makes people want to read it. And so you talked about the, the identity thing, Ryan, you brought that up. Mm -hmm. um, I found for me, that was one of the hardest things to let go of. People mm -hmm. often ask like, what was the hardest thing for you to get rid of? And they expect me to say, well, it was a big screen TV or my second Lexus or something. <laughs> and, and the honest answer is like the hardest thing to let go of was my identity. Oh, I believe it. And it's the first thing we ask someone, right? Like, what do you do? And then we have to recite like, what is our job title that's on the business card? What fits on the business card? That is who I am as a person right. and we get so tethered to that identity that it, it it's suffocating and it becomes difficult to make a change that that doesn't align with that identity well you see this in all kinds of areas right you get like the band that gets locked into their first album and then like it's hard for them to create or make something new or you have like the manager who's always done it like his way and that's the way that you know the department has to run and yeah. the more locked in you get to into that identity or like the the surgeon who her particular strategy for surgery is like the way to go, even though the up and coming residents want to use some kind of new technology or something. And like that conflict is basically identity conflict at mm -hmm. some level, right? It's like, I identify as this kind of person who does this type of thing and change runs counter to that. Yeah. And with respect to minimalism, a lot of the items that we have, like you said, Oh, people think, Oh, maybe it's a big screen TV or a car or something, but really it's what those things represent. Yeah. Right. It's like, I, you don't get the Lexus just because you need a car. You get it because it's a status signal, right? Yeah. Because you think it represents something. It, um, it represents the identity that you want to show to the people around you. And so, in a lot of ways, the process of behavior change is really identity change, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, you're really asking someone to, not get rid of something or change a behavior. You're asking them to like see themselves in a new light. And once you can do that, then the process of like getting rid of the car, giving away the TV, that's easy. That that's just a logistical thing. It's, it's almost yeah. like anti advertising in a way. Cause you talked about the, the Lexus thing there. In fact, what they're trying to do is have you identify with that object, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That expensive, you know, 60, $80,000 object. In fact, I remember a few years ago, the marketing campaign, they may even still use this as their slogan. It was like, they say money can't buy happiness. <laughs> Those people are spending their money wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and it's uh, wow. And yeah. and and the the well the implicit message there is this Lexus will make you happy. Right. And and without even defining what happiness really means, I mean, what a what a squirrely word, word that is. And we've had so many conversations about the difference between happiness and joy and satisfaction and peace and contentment and all of these things are used synonymously and I, even I use them synonymously, but but they they tend to embody different states and. And I think one thing that we've realized, the reason
reason that we, we stumble into these bad habits that we have established, these bad habits, they are, they are a way to give us that ephemeral pleasure the you know the smoking a cigarette is a is a uh, and a very easy example because it, it, that's the stereotypical sort of bad habit, but it changes our state immediately, and so we develop these bad habits through routine. Mm-hmm. We develop good habits, it seems to me, through deliberate or intentional action. Yeah. And uh, in your book, you obviously talk about the ways to move away from bad habits to good habits, and a lot of our questions today are about that let me read one more thing i want to ask james a question so uh just again flipping through like this the tons of stuff i got underlined here um you've got this uh, part and i think it's the second chapter every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become no single instance will transform your beliefs but as the votes build up so does the evidence of your new identity and then a little bit more down the page you wrote every time you choose to perform a bad habit it's a vote for that identity so uh, the reason why this stands out to me, A, is because, I mean, it's, it's spot on, man. I, I love to think about, um, w- w- well, when people talk about minimalism and uh, the things they bring into their lives or the resources that they use, those are all votes for, for who we want to be and who we are. Um, but also it speaks to why your book is called Atomic Habits. So maybe explain that a little bit before we dive into these questions. So what, what, why atomic habits? Yeah, sure. So I chose the phrase atomic habits for three reasons. So the first meaning of the word atomic is what you might expect, right? Like tiny or small, like an atom. Mm -hmm. And that's a core piece of my philosophy. Like habits should be small and easy to do. The second meaning of the word atomic and the one that's often overlooked is the fundamental unit in a larger system. So like atoms build into molecules, molecules build into compounds and so on. Mm -hmm. And in a way, our habits are sort of like the atoms of our lives. You know, like they're these little routines that you do each day. And when you put them all together, you end up with this larger system of your daily routine. And then the third and final meaning of the word atomic is the source of immense energy or power. And I think that if you combine all three of those meanings, you understand the narrative arc of the book, Mm -hmm. which is if you make changes that are small and easy to do and you layer them on top of each other like units in a larger system, then you end up with some really powerful or remarkable results in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Do you differentiate habits from routine? And if so, how? Yeah. uh, So technically speaking, yes, they're different. So the technical definition of a habit is a behavior that's been repeated enough to be more or less automatic, right? You can do it pretty much without thinking. So tying your shoes, brushing your teeth, unplugging the toaster after each use, like stuff like that. Um, But we often use the word habit in a broader sense, right? Like you might say, I want to get in the habit of writing or I want to build the habit of going to the gym. And I know what you mean when you say that. Technically, that would be more of a routine because a routine is kind of a repeated practice, but it doesn't necessarily have to be automatic or non-conscious. But I think the key distinction here, and this is where habits can be really useful, is that habits often initiate routines. So, for example, you might have a habit of answering email for an hour each day. And while you're answering emails, you're not totally on autopilot. You're thinking carefully about how to respond to the message and so on. But it's often the habit, the automatic non-conscious action of pulling your phone out of your pocket that initiates the routine of responding to email. Mm -hmm. And so I think a key point here is that, and this is why I like to recommend people start if they're looking to like build a new habit. One good place to start is with what I call the two minute rule. So the basic idea is you take whatever habit you're trying to build and you scale it down to just the first two minutes because you can't, you often cannot automate an entire routine, right? Like writing, writing is about as effortful as it gets, right? You're not just going to go on autopilot for an hour, but you can automate the first action. You can automate the habit kind of of like uh, habits are sort of like an entrance ramp to the highway, Mm -hmm. right? So Mm -hmm. using this two minute rule, you take whatever routine you're trying to build, whatever big goal you're looking at, say it's like, I want to read 50 books a year. And you scale it down to just the first two minutes. So it's like read one page right. or do yoga four days a week. And that becomes like take out my yoga mat uh-huh. and stuff like that is quick enough and repetitive enough that you could like automate the start of it. And then that kind of sends you in the right direction. Also, you, you mentioned writing. And in fact, our first question is about writing and, and we'll get into that in a second. But I know one of the things that that for me uh 
you you talk about habit being the the exit ramp onto the the highway here of routine but for me i had a bunch of roadblocks on the exit ramp too right (laughs) like i had all these rules set up for me that i will start writing once i've made my coffee and the laundry is folded and uh i've swept the floor and i've removed the dishes from the dishwasher and like there are all of these the these rules i set up And, and so inevitably i'd have 15 rules set up 15 roadblocks and i'd remove 14 of them but there was always one i always had one additional excuse and part of that is because you're afraid to actually just do the work because it, it seems well when you think of the the full routine it seems so overwhelming it's like right. let me put one other roadblock up that prevents me from doing it. so i have an excuse in a way and so for me i, I re- also realized in order to make the habit m- easier or, or simpler I had to remove those roadblocks, have fewer rules. For me, the rule now is I have to wake up. Like that's my only rule in order to start writing is I have to wake up in the morning. Now, if I could remove that rule and start writing in my sleep, that'd be even better. (laughs) But that is my one rule. Uh, The dishes might not be done. The the coffee's not made, you know, whatever. But as long as I wake up, then that's my trigger to to get into that habit of of writing. And eventually Mm -hmm. it becomes a, it does become a a routine. And speaking of that, our first question is from Keith. Yana in Washington. I'm certainly not a writer, but sometimes I feel like I could benefit by writing in a journal in a sense, perhaps, but I don't, I'm not good at that. And do you have any tips about how to create those habits or a good approach? All right. So a few things here that stood out to me in Kiana's question. Um, she wants to develop the habit for writing. So that, that is a step in the right direction. Although she has thrown up her own roadblocks here, James. She said, I'm not a writer. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as though like there are certain babies that are born with a quill in their hand and all of a sudden they, they've come out of the womb ready to, to uh, um, write the, the, the perfect Don DeLillo novel or something. Um, uh, she said, I'm not good at that. Well, I mean, I don't think anyone's good at writing. My, my, my daughter's five, right? And uh, she's a terrible writer. You should see the novel she tried to write. <laughs> it's, it's awful. She can <laughs> hardly spell my name. Um, and, and so uh, th- the thing is, you're not good at it until you get better at it. And, and the thing that I, I realized, like, it took me most of my 20s. Uh, and by the way, I held the writing of my 20s fairly precious as well like for me like everything that came off of my pen was like man this is gorgeous even though it was terrible in retrospect (laughs) you look back uh, I wrote a novel in my 20s and it was actually the best of the the stuff that 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 didn't hit the cutting room floor and um and there are pieces in there that are truly gorgeous but it took all the sediment to find the gold so to speak and the thing that I would tell Kiana is the thing I tell tell writing students is, uh, in fact, I trick them into taking my writing class. It's not really a writing class; it's a habits class that's focused around writing. It's nice. it's getting people to <laughs> to actually write every day. It's it's one of the weird things. There are a few things like this where people aspire to be a writer, but they don't actually do the writing. You don't know anyone who aspires to be like a bricklayer, but mm. has never like laid a brick before. Mm. And they're like, well, I'm, I'm just one day I'll be a bricklayer. Yeah. But with writing, uh, we, we uh, somehow expect through osmosis or something. Osmosis and in, in, uh, motivation. Like, so, like I know for me, one of the hardest barriers to get past is like waiting on that motivation to write and real and, you know, oh, yeah. realizing years and years ago, like, oh, if I'm, if I'm going to wait on the motivation to write, or if I'm going to wait on the motivation to go out and start laying bricks to become a bricklayer, mm-hmm. I'll be waiting my whole life. I'll just there'll just be aspiration everywhere, right. <laughs> and, and nothing accomplished. There are a lot of people who are like that. They wake up each day and wonder, like, oh, maybe today will be the day I feel like writing, or maybe today will be the day I feel like going to the gym. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't work. Though. I mean, podcast Sean, who was it? Was it Faulkner or was it Fitzgerald who said, "I I make sure that." Um, uh, he, I, I write only when I'm inspired, and I make sure I'm inspired every morning at 8:30 a.m. Yeah, yeah, it was Faulkner. Quote. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and and, and uh, the the key is like you, it, it's it's the, the inspiration doesn't have to be this grandiose thing. You don't have to be hit with an inspiration stick every morning in order to to feel inspired. So, what what advice do you have for Kiana James? If she's if she wants to. Yeah, start journaling. She thinks journaling would be beneficial, and and I, I actually in my writing class I I distinguish between journaling, which I think is pretty much just expressive writing, and then 
writing for a public audience, although I think journaling can often be a good place to start. But if she wants to build this habit, where does she start? Sure. So I think there are two core issues. You brought up one already, this idea of like, oh, I'm not good at that or I'm not a writer. And this echoes back to what Ryan brought up earlier about the identity piece, right? And you see this with all kinds of habits. People will say things like, um, you know, I have a sweet tooth or I'm terrible at remembering directions or I'm not good at math. And as soon as you internalize those kind of identities, then doing that action becomes much less desirable, right? If you think like, oh, I'm terrible at writing, well, then you sit down to write and you kind of have this internal resistance. So the natural next question is, all right, that makes sense, but then what do I actually do? Like, how do I get over that? Right. And this is where we come back to the evidence piece. And this is where I think my philosophy and approach differs a little bit from what you typically hear, which are things like fake it till you make it or something like that. Yeah. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with fake it till you make it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with like believing in yourself or being positive, but it's a short term strategy, not a long term one, mm -hmm. because fake it till you make it asks you to believe something about yourself that you don't have evidence for. Mm -hmm. And there we have a word for beliefs that don't have evidence. We call it delusion, right? Like at mm -hmm. some point, the brain doesn't <laughs> like that and you have this conflict. So the way to develop and believe in a new identity, the way to see yourself as a writer is to cast small votes excuse me, is to cast small votes for that identity. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the case of journaling, which I think it could be a great way to start, um, I actually, we have a journal, a habit journal coming out uh, in January, and it's specifically designed for this purpose, which is that a lot of people say, I would like to start journaling. And then they think it needs to be this huge lofty goal. They think that it needs to be this thing where they write like three pages a day or something. Um, but instead, this journal is designed around write one sentence. Um, and so you just write one sentence about each day. Mm -hmm. And that is a simple way for her to start. And I have a friend who uh, teaches English and is a poet and his uh, daily writing habit is to write one sentence. And there are many days where he will write a full page, but on the bad days, he still gets one sentence in. Which yeah. is better than nothing at all. And it's kind of a key for establishing these identities, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, let's say that you wanna become a fit person, but you don't see yourself in that way right now. Well, you could just like try to do something crazy and join a CrossFit gym or start doing P90X or Insanity or something like that. And this is what a lot of people do, right? Sure. Especially around January. They all get amped nothing. up. Yes. Right. We get into this all or nothing mentality. And you do that for like three weeks and then you fall off course and you slide back to what you normally did. And then like three months later, you do it all over again. You feel like, oh, I need to get in shape or whatever. But um, I had a reader who ended up losing over 100 pounds. And one of the first things they did was he went to the gym, but he wasn't allowed to stay for longer than five minutes. So he would get in the car, drive to the gym, get out, do like half an exercise, get back in the car, drive home. And it sounds silly when you first hear about it, right? It sounds ridiculous. It's like, why would that do anything? But what you realize is he was mastering the art of showing up. He was becoming the type of person that went to the gym four days a week. Because if you're not the type of person that drives to the gym, you have no hope of being the kind of person that like actually works out there for a while. Mm -hmm. And so, um, he basically fostered that identity of being that kind of person who showed up. And this is a key insight about building better habits, whether it's Kiana and a writing habit or fitness habits or whatever, a habit must be established before it can be improved. And so the very first thing to do is to master the art of showing up. It's not to worry mm -hmm. about the performance. It's not to worry about what the writing looks like. I had to do this with myself, right? Like I, when I started building jamesclear.com, I wrote a new article every Monday and Thursday mm -hmm. and my the way that I made it happen was it didn't matter how long or how short the work was. It doesn't didn't matter how good or how bad it was. It didn't matter how I felt about it. If all I could do was write one good paragraph, that's what I was doing. But something had to get out on Monday and Thursday. Mm -hmm. And after I did that for three years, I turned around. And now I view myself as a writer, but it didn't start that way. Right. And, and you were less concerned about whatever that end manifestation of of, of what a writer means. So be, yeah. Being a writer in in Kiana's mind is like, well, I, mean, I don't know what she means by I'm not a writer. I, you haven't published seven books or something. Because <laughs> um, if so, then I'm not a writer, right? Because right. I've only published four books. And right. so like, I'm still yeah. trying. <laughs> and and for me, I tell you the thing that, that that really stood out to me, and I think you're you're you're, you're saying this in, in, in your words, but the thing I try to convey to writing students is I'm much less concerned about the noun and I'm much more concerned about the verb. Like, mm. I don't care if you're a writer, or I care if you're writing. Right, yeah. And and because there are plenty of writers who stop writing, and then all of a sudden you don't hear from them anymore. And, and well, what's that, what's that worth if you're not writing? Maybe you, you once wrote, but um, 
also, I, can we talk about maybe enjoying the process a little bit? I know there there is like this old apathum, uh, and I, I am I fall outside the uh, the norm here. There's this old apathum though of writers don't like writing; they like having written. <laughs> and 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 yeah. for me, I, I'm the opposite of that. I don't like anything that I've ever written, <laughs> but I enjoy the process of writing. Um, and I can go back and look at things and say, "Wow, that was good." But I'm usually just neurosing over like a comma splice or something. But for me. Half the time, I want to put my head through a wall. Writing sucks, and it's like, oh, how can I go through this? The other time, it's elation. Mm. And, and there's something about that the peaks and valleys of writing, there, there's a huge payoff for me. So can you talk about that in the broader context of forming a habit? Like sometimes it's, there is drudgery, and we have to drudge through the drudgery. And other times, there is pure joy from, or not even joy, just, just uh, satisfaction from the, the, the product that you're producing. Well, so some of this can come down to just the habit you select, right? Like there are many different forms of the same kind of habit. Like let's take an exercise habit, right? A lot of times it could be strength training, but not everybody has to work out like a bodybuilder. Like right. you could do hiking or kayaking or yoga or Pilates or, you know, a million other things. So choose the form of the habit that is most enjoyable to you. Like that's a good first step. Yeah, um, that you know, there's no me. reason to make yourself suffer. That reminds me of, uh, you, you know, Matt Diavella, uh, yeah. our good friend, yeah, yeah. Uh, director of our, our documentary Minimalism. Um, and when he first like started on his own, he stopped doing client work and it was after our documentary came out and he started his own website and he was picking other people's habits. And so like, he's like, I guess I'll start blogging cause that's what other people do, but he's not a writer. He's a, a he's not bad at writing. Um, but he didn't want to do it. Like right. it was, he, he saw what other people did. And so he didn't even want, think he would find any real value from it. He just saw this other template, but he realized like, well, after doing it for a few months, he was like, wait a minute. I'm a filmmaker mm. and this, <laughs> why am I blogging? <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's a good example though, right? Like yeah. you can <clears throat> distribute a message in many different ways. It could right. be video, it could be podcast, it could be written, it could be something else, but like choose the form of content that is most satisfying to you. And, yeah. and you can experiment with that too. I know with Ryan and I, when we first started, uh, in fact, it was eight years ago, we started uh, the minimalists and uh, it was like eight years ago today, wasn't it? Uh, on, yeah, well, the, they were recording no. this. Am I on here on the day? I think it's, it's, well, on it's, the it's eight year like three anniversary. Days away. It's three, three, day, oh, three, it's three days, days away. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> the, day, the, the day we're recording this, it's uh, three days away from the eight year anniversary. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, man. When we started, it was like it was just a blog, and that was one vehicle, right? I was picking that one vehicle. Now, I think we would have been really overwhelmed how we said, all right, here's the habits we want to build. We, we need to do a blog. We need to write three books together. And, uh, we, we need to start a YouTube channel. We need to go on nine tours <laughs> in eight years. Um, we need, yeah, we got to start a YouTube channel and then we got to be on all the social media, uh, Pinterest and, and Vine and whatever else is out there. Um, and, oh, and we got to do a podcast, right? And we, of course, we need to do a video podcast. We need a podcast studio. Um, in addition to that, we need, and you just keeps going and going and i think that is often like the big hurdle when when someone like kiana says i'm not a writer she says i'm i have i'm not, not fully established mm. i haven't i i haven't fully actualized any of these things but we never actualize it's a horizon and once you get yeah. to that horizon there's always a new horizon yeah what, what i like about what, when when you write about how pushing through that boredom like that is really where the the habit takes takes hold um that is probably my biggest downfall mm -hmm. is i will start i mean with guitar it's like i learned enough chords to where if you put some chords in front of me i can keep up but like it got boring after a while so now i've you know i still play guitar every once in a blue moon but i'm not super passionate about it but it's because i haven't been able to or taken the time to push through that boredom maybe uh maybe speak can you speak a little bit more to that about yeah so I have this just kind of general idea that you need to fall in love with boredom, but mm -hmm. there's a fine line there. So it's kind of like two sides of this coin. So the first piece is, um, I, so I'm into weightlifting. I, I played baseball, as you mentioned for a while. And then once I got done, I was looking for an outlet. And so I started doing some competitive weightlifting stuff. And one day this coach came to our gym and he had worked with some really elite athletes like Olympians and things like that. And I asked him, Hey, you know, like, what is the difference between these people who are like really high level and, you know, the rest of us like me? And he was like, well, you know, like some of the things are what you would expect, like genetics or, you know, whatever their nutrition training program, that kind of thing. But honestly, at the end of the day, the thing that makes the biggest difference is who can settle into the boredom of doing the same kind of lifts 
every day, day after day. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people can't handle that. Right. They they get they use boredom as a reason to to jump to something new. You know, yeah. it's like we're always looking for the best diet plan or the perfect business idea or the new way to like get results faster. I'm just not feeling it, so I'm just going to go on and move on to something else. And I don't know why we do this to ourselves. Like I I had a guy that I trained with who I mean, he's incredibly strong and he was making progress on this squat program he was doing. And then I didn't see him for a few months and I came back to him. I was like, Hey, how's it going? And he was like, Oh yeah. Training hasn't been that good in the last month. And I was like, well, what, you know, are you still doing that program that was working so well? And he was like, no. I was like, well, why not? <laughs> uh, he, it basically just got bored of it. And yeah. it's like, dude, if like, you know, don't complain about not getting a cake. If you're not going to follow the recipe, yeah. right? like it's just I, I, falling in love with boredom. That is uh, Kevin Rose brought that up when we were on his podcast mm-hmm. and like that concept, it's almost like if I could train myself when I feel bored, to realize like oh like this bored feeling this is what i this is what i need to feel right now in order to you know get to this next step i mean i could almost see myself getting a little excited being yeah. bored well it gives you a way to reframe it but here's the challenge this is the other side of the coin so there's this concept i talk about later in atomic habits called the goldilocks rule and the basic idea is that like imagine you're playing tennis right mm-hmm. and so if you play against a professional like Roger Federer or Serena Williams or something it's going to get boring pretty quick you're right. going to get beat every point right <laughs> um, if you play against like a 4 year old it might be cute but if you're trying to play like a real game that's going to get boring cuz you're going to win every point yeah. i don't know man but, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're the guy who goes to the hospital and like yeah. beats kids in madden by like 100 points <laughs> right. that's what i'm doing with ella all the you're time like, she can't score one bucket on oh, me still. Yeah, no, no. i'm sorry i'm derailing guys no you're, you're so, absolutely right <laughs> But if you play someone who's like your level, right? You win a few points, they win a few points. You have a chance to win the match, but only if you really try. It's like us with ping pong. I was just thinking the same thing, man. But Ryan and I are aggressively mediocre at ping pong. <laughs> like we but play like to eleven, but it usually like we'll be at twenty points right, before but you're at the same level, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, almost. I, like Ryan wins fifty-one percent of the time. <laughs> right. Not true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's mostly because he performs really well under stress, and I don't. <laughs> mm. um, so yeah, but but yeah, I, you're right. It, it's the reason I enjoy that. If I've tried to play with Ella, it's like, God, this is terrible, right? Well, if you can be in that zone, what I would call the Goldilocks zone, um, not too hard, not too easy, just right. Mm-hmm. You know, like you're the human brain loves challenges like that of uh, just manageable difficulty. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you could make this happen, but you got to put some effort in. That's where you get into like a state of flow yeah. where you're, you know, fully engaged and uh, your attention is all in the moment because you're you're not bored by it. You're right on that razor's edge of your ability. And so if you can manage that, then you can avoid a little bit of this downfall of boredom, right? How do I fall in love with boredom or whatever? And so this is why sometimes it's important to like graduate your habits to increase the difficulty just a touch. And I really like this concept of like, can I get 1% better each day? Because it's small enough that it seems easy to do. And it is in many cases, but you're never staying static, right? You're always looking to grow a little bit Mm -hmm. and stay on that edge of your ability. And um, it's hard to know exactly what that is in a lot of areas in life, but that general philosophy of can I nudge this just a little bit more See, uh, I, I, can keep you engaged. I love that approach because like when people ask me about habits, they'll say, oh, I want to eat healthy, I want to exercise, and I want to start writing. Yeah. Help me out. Yeah. And it's like take the top off the usually, yeah. usually what I'll say is, well, you know, pick one habit yeah. and start there. But with this 1% increase you could even so you, you take many habits break it down to one habit okay i'm going to choose this one habit but then you can eat, take that one habit and then you could break it down to many pieces right and imagine say, like the habit of eating healthy right there's like mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff associated with that you have grocery shopping habits you've got like food prep and chopping habits yeah. you have cleanup habits and you could you could just pick one of those and try to get a little better at that right but it's all still organized around the same mission of eating healthy yeah absolutely the uh the example i remember using in your in your book was working out it's like maybe your goal is you want to get to the gym you know five times a week and you want to get there for 45 minutes um instead of focusing on like all right today's monday i'm going to get up i'm going to i'm going to start uh going to the gym today i'm going to go for 45 minutes and i'm going to do that consecutively for the next four days that isn't as easy as saying okay today i'm going to get up and i'm going to put my workout clothes on yeah. And then tomorrow I'm going to get up, I'm going to put my workout clothes on and then I'm going to, I'm going to step outside. Yeah. And then maybe you get to that point where you're going to the gym for five minutes. But once you start just incorporating these 1% increment changes, it, it starts to give you a bit of momentum. It's like the gal you talk about in New York city where mm-hmm. she gets up every morning and she's like, she, she goes out to the curb. She wa- weighs the cab down and she's like, bring me to, you know, whatever gym that she goes and works out to like, 
that is, that's the habit right there. It's yeah. not getting to the gym. She works out for two hours every day, but the real habit is hailing the cab because yeah. she knows if she does that, the rest of it's, and I, I do the same thing. I mean, I've been working out for years, but it's changing into my workout clothes. That's the thing that if that happens, everything else will just happen as a side effect. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking of two things. One is an extreme example of an agoraphobe, a people, a person who's afraid to leave their house, right? Um, quite often when they work with psychotherapists or psychoanalysts, um, they, the, 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 it is developing the habit of today I'm going to touch the doorknob and then this week I'm going to practice doing that. I'm going to turn mm. the doorknob eventually until I can get one step outside. Right. Yes. And, and then before you know it, a month or two months, three months down the road, all of a sudden they're outside. And had you forced them to do that on day one, they would have panicked and shut down and never wanted to do it again. And I think the same thing is true with habits. If the CrossFit thing, there are some people who can go do CrossFit and all of a sudden that it becomes their new habit. Um, usually they have a certain level of baseline fitness uh, to start with. Right. Um, however, um, a lot of people uh, are overwhelmed by that. And so they, they'll do it and they'll feel so sore the next day that it's like, I mean, I have friends who have done this, but they, they've just like, dude, I did that with the Peloton like you did. I was uh, like, Oh, I'm going to read the Peloton every single day. Oh yeah. I did try that for, <laughs> and it lasted eight days and I was about dead. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's a good point. The other thing that I'm thinking about is the 30 day minimalism game. Are you familiar with this? It's something no. that, that we've had tens of thousands of, of readers and listeners do. Uh, it's a way to develop a habit. So the way that, and by the way, I think guess today's the, the first day of the month. So it's a great time to start. Uh, basically the average American household has 300,000 items in it. And so we're overwhelmed. It's like, I want to get rid of some stuff, but I have no idea where to even start, right? And so uh, we found a way to make decluttering a little bit more fun with some friendly competition because uh, I don't know about you, but for me, the, just the thought of decluttering is really boring. Like I have to go clean out my closet or my garage or my basement. That sounds awful. I'd rather do anything else yeah. today. Um, but we found a way to make it uh, a little bit more enjoyable with some friendly competition. So here's how it works at the beginning of the month. So today you partner up with someone, a friend, a family member, a coworker, someone that you know, and you both say, we're going to get rid of some stuff this month. The first day of the month, it starts off really easy. You get rid of one item on the first day of the month. And so you talk about improving 1% each day. That's essentially what we're doing here. Um, except we're just going uh, are the number of, of days corresponds to the number of items you get rid of so day two it's two items anyone can get rid of two items it doesn't matter which item just pick an item on day one day two two items day three three items starts off get you that momentum you need yeah. by the middle of the month it gets more difficult but you already have that momentum so day 15 you're like oh wow i have to get rid of 15 items today and tomorrow i have to get rid of 16 items and then on day 20 i have to get rid of 20 items and you bet whatever you want at the beginning of the month so um whoever goes the longest throughout the month wins if you both make it to the end of the month and you've gotten rid of about 500 items and it's a really good start. We've had uh, tens of thousands of people share it on, on social media. So if you're listening to this at home and, and you want to check it out, it's just theminimalists.com slash game. And uh, you can check out the hashtag there. Like literally there's like tens of thousands of pictures. It's you, pretty the, cool. The like stuff seeing, people, you, yeah, the people yeah. are getting rid of is amazing. And, well, and some people go beyond a month. They'll be like, day 31, I'm getting rid of 31. I'm going to do Day 365. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's amazing. It's crazy, man. Well, it's funny, thinking about the, the, the men's game through your lens, you've got, you've got this atomic approach where like you are on a daily basis kind of making these small improvements. You've got accountability. Mm. But then you also, you got an accountability partner, but then you also ha have this accountability with... Um, with you know what you bet what the reward is or what the punishment is if you if you lose the game and it reminds me of the contract mm. that you talked about in your book just uh so this is like an extreme version of like how to motivate yourself but talk about the contract that this dude did with yeah. his trainer and girlfriend. yeah so uh this guy named brian harris entrepreneur um he uh he wanted to lose weight and get in shape he had i think they had had one or two kids at this point so he's just like um i don't know you know being a parent of young kids is crazy and he hadn't worked out as much as he wanted to and he just like wanted to get healthier and so he hired a personal trainer um but he wasn't making the progress he wanted and so he came up with this uh what i call habit contract and so he wrote down, he did it for each quarter. So it was like a three month span and he wrote down, uh, you know, my habits for this quarter, my goals are going to be the following. I'm going to, you know, weigh myself each day. I'm going to go to the gym four days a week and I'm going to, you know, like follow the following nutrition plan or whatever. 
And then if I don't do those things, the punishments will be the following. And he uh, he's a huge Auburn football fan, so he hates Alabama. So if he didn't fall through, he had, he'd had he have to wear like an Alabama hat every uh, day for the whole quarter. <laughs> or um, he is an entrepreneur and doesn't want to dress up, and so he like often wears jeans or comfortable clothes. So uh, if he didn't fall through, he would have to wear like a su- an actual suit or like nice clothes. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, so those are the punishments. Yeah. And then at the very bottom, he... Uh, said, you know, if I do not follow these things, I'll have to follow, do the following punishments and consequences. And um, he signed it, his wife signed it, and his personal trainer all signed it. It seems like an overkill. A Doesn't bit. it? It a seemed extreme bit. to me when I first heard it. I was like, man, it just seems like overly formal, right? right? To have to, to like make a contract for yourself and sign it. But I was asking him about it and he said, I swear to you, the thing that makes it happen is signing it. Like that makes it real. And, um, he did it and it worked. He stuck right. He stuck all his habits for the quarter. So he made another one for the next quarter and that worked. And, um, yeah, as far as I know, he's still using it. It's it's, been really effective. I mean, I think it's like an extreme example, but it's not so extreme. Like it makes me want to do a habits contract with you, Josh. Like I will (laughs) let you win at every game of ping pong. (laughs) (laughs) I will have to wear a Michigan hat. I don't care. So there is, so you don't care, but I I would care. Oh, (laughs) So there's one more point I want to come back to, which you mentioned the this idea of like falling in love with the process, yeah. right? And this is true for pretty much any habit to stick that, and I talk about this in the book, the fourth stage of a habit is the reward or the satisfaction or on the other side, a consequence. But basically whenever a habit is followed by a pleasurable feeling, it is like a positive emotional signal to your brain that says, hey, this felt good. You should do this again next time. And so what you find are that bad habits form readily because they often provide that immediate uh, satisfaction right away. You know, like if you eat, um, take a lot of bad habits, like eating a cookie or eating a donut, pretty much every behavior produces multiple outcomes across time. So like the immediate outcome of eating a cookie is great. It's sugary, it's tasty, it's favorable. The ultimate outcome, if you repeat that habit for two months or a year or whatever, is unfavorable. Mm -hmm. And with good habits, it's often the reverse. Like the immediate outcome of sitting down to write rather than watching Netflix is kind of like unfavorable. You like are forcing yourself to do something you don't really feel like doing or giving up on something that might be more satisfying. Or the immediate outcome of like going to the gym is effortful and you sweat and you know like it's hard work but the ultimate outcome if you stick with that habit for two months or a year is favorable Mm -hmm. and so a lot of the balance of falling in love with the process of figuring out how to stick with good habits in the long run is how do you take the long-term rewards that delayed gratification and pull it into the present moment yeah and i think that people who do that well who stick to habits for the long run one of the things that they do that doesn't seem obvious at first glance is they find alternative ways to be satisfied in the moment. So like I just gave that fitness example, right? Like you go to the gym and the immediate outcome is it's kind of effortful and hard, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't really feel like that to me when I go to the gym. Like I, I think, Oh, I get to see some of my friends and I get to move my body today. And I focus on like how it makes me feel in the moment rather than stress, right? There are like all these things that happen right away. And if you can shift your attention to the immediate benefit, then it feels like, oh, I'm enjoying the process. And then I also get the long-term benefits of maybe the scale is lighter in 30 days or maybe I'm stronger in six months or whatever. Yeah. So it's really not that much about delaying gratification, but about finding alternative ways of immediate satisfaction. I love how you talk about the, in your book, you talk about this like sandwiching a reward with the habit and then a reward. So like, for example, it would be, um, I'm going to have, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to, I'm going to have a cup of coffee and then I'm going to write. And that, that could be your trigger for writing or for Josh, it's just waking up. Like that's the trigger for writing. But then after, after you have written, you can say, okay, now that I've written, now I can watch a little bit of Netflix. Now I can give myself an hour on Netflix or maybe it's an hour of video games, but I, I've never really explored that approach. And I know that actually is kind of too you like, like you took two things to kind of sandwich it together in your yeah. book there, but but yeah, just uh, finding ways to essentially, like you said, man, like make the short come, uh, uh, the short term uh, worth it, basically. Right. Well, so there, yeah, there are kind of two things going on there. So the first is what I call habit stacking, and I first learned this from uh, B.J. Fogg, who's a professor at Stanford. But the basic idea is you take the habit you're trying to build and you stack it on top of one you already do. So if you make a cup of coffee every morning, then you could say. After I make my morning cup of coffee, I will meditate for 60 seconds. Mm-hmm. And that's how you like layer that meditation habit in. Um, but then you can also do what you mentioned, which is uh, a 
a special form of habit stacking where you use temptation bundling is what it's called, but you take something you want to do and you pair it with something you need to do. So like I heard from one woman who she always had these overdue work emails and she's like, I need to be better at processing email, but she wanted to get a pedicure. And so she created this rule for herself where she said, I'm allowed to get a pedicure, but only if I answer overdue work emails. You hear that Jordan? (laughs) Or (laughs) if you respond to your emails on time, you're allowed to go get a pedicure. (laughs) But what I love about this is like, she could sit there on her phone while she's getting the pedicure. Yeah, yeah, right. And respond, and, and respond to the you know, there's out. like another story in the book of uh, this engineering student who he knew that he needed to be working out more, but he was just binging Netflix all the time. Mm. And so he linked up, he used his engineering degree and linked his computer to his stationary bike. And so whenever he wasn't pedaling, Netflix would pause. Um, and so it's like he was allowed <laughs> so to watch good. Netflix, but only if he was cycling. It made wow. me think like um, that dude should just mass manufacture those bikes. Oh, 100%. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that should be, yeah. That, I think about the month pretty good or idea. The, the year with some some of my best habits ever that, that really led to the habits that I have now where they have become routine. It was when I removed a lot of those distractions, right? And, and so um, I did a whole bunch of experiments uh, after I left the corporate world. So I was 30, 31 at the time. Um, I got rid of home internet. I got rid of TV at home. Um, I got rid of my cell phone for a couple months. And you were confronted with a special kind of loneliness when you've removed those big pacifiers, the TV, the internet, and your phone. And you come home and you're like, well, I have a computer, but it doesn't do anything except let me type into it. And um, what are those things on the shelves? Oh, those are books. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I remember how to read. <laughs> and and, uh, and it allowed me to sit with that boredom. Um, you, you mentioned uh, getting good and getting comfortable with boredom. There's a book about boredom. Uh, it's David Foster Wallace's last book. I don't know if, if you ever read it. It's called The Pale King. Mm, no, and, I haven't and, read that one. It, it, but so it, the whole book is about boredom. It's, it's fiction, but it takes place in 1985 in the IRS office <laughs> in Peoria, Illinois. I mean, I can't think of a better backdrop for extreme boredom than 1980s IRS office. This Somewhere is where there's a poor IRS employee listening to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, this is before they even had like computers. So it's, everything was just these forms and like it was, I mean, the whole book is about boredom, but what you realize the, the whole book is mimetic of the actual routine of boredom, like mm. it's beautiful. Mm. There's something really gorgeous about the writing of the book. So it's gorgeous throughout, but there's also a, a particular payoff. If you get all the way through it, it's a boring book, but it's sp- it's supposed to be boring. Right. It's set up to be gorgeous and boring at the same time. And you have to drudge through that boredom in order to get the payoff. And the payoff is worth it if you're willing to sit with that boredom for, for that long. Yeah. And so um, I think that is like the perfect metaphor for any habit that you're building that is sometimes it's going to require some boredom. And yes, especially up front, Kiana, you were not going to be good at it. I mean, anything uh, anything you're going to do, you're not going to be good at at first. It could be basketball or sex or mm. fishing or skiing or reading or weightlifting or writing. Um, they all take effort to get good. And also, I think you have to reframe what good is. Right now, good for you is going to be different from good for someone else. Good for you might be just getting that one sentence out a day. That is good. And then you can build on top of that good and make it great eventually. Yeah. Uh, Keanu, I'd love to send you two things. One is I want to send you a copy of Atomic Habits. We got James here, so maybe I can get him to sign this. Oh, yeah, for sure. And we'll uh, podcast Sean if you could send this to her. Or if you want the uh, the audio book, I'm sure we could get you an audio book, copy of that as well. It's not out an audio book now? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, and so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll send you either one of those. Or if you want the ebook version, We'll send you one of those as well. And then also, since you're talking about writing, I have a writing class. It's called How to Write Better. And uh, you can, if you're listening to this, you can find it at howtowritebetter.org. But Kiana, it's a four-week class. I want to give you uh, that class. And hopefully, as long as you're willing to commit to it, uh, commit to the habit for 30 days of writing. I've got some uh, some tips, some literature, and also some of my own personal best practices that I think will help you through the the habit of, of writing, but also getting better at writing and, and building on top of some of those fundamentals like grammar. And uh, well, there's just a whole, there's a bunch of resources in there that I think you'll find value in Kiana. So howtowritebetter.org. Sean, if you could reach out to her and give her both of those, Atomic Habits and How to Write Better, I'd appreciate it. Oh, and uh, one other thing I forgot to mention, Ryan, one of the best things I ever did for my writing, hmm. and and you alluded to this, James, was start a blog. She yeah. said she wants to start journaling, and I think that's great. 
But if you want to be held accountable publicly, now publicly can be with your 17 Facebook friends as well, starting a blog somewhere. It could be literally just starting a blog on Facebook. Facebook has Facebook notes feature now or um, starting a Medium blog or uh, Tumblr or whatever. Um, Ryan and I have a guide on our website of how to start a blog, uh, exactly what we did, the whole process. Um, we were really clueless. I tried to like design an HTML blog like at first. I had no idea what to do. <laughs> and he coming up like a month later, he's like, dude, we can't do this. <laughs> he's like, HTML. He's like, I have no idea. I've got to go to college to learn how to do HTML. Yeah, I couldn't even <laughs> spell HTML. I, mean, I was trying to like, like figure out how to build a blog. And then we figured out all the appropriate steps. So if you want to follow the same recipe that we followed Kiana or anyone else who's listening to this go, just go to theminimalists.com slash blog you can see exactly what we did also we have on there like 20 recommendations for your blog uh, 15 reasons to start a blog 3 reasons not to start a blog one of them has to do with money um, <laughs> and so uh, yeah you can find all that there at theminimalists.com slash blog all right and we'd love to hear what you all have to say so if you have a comment or a tip for any of our callers today uh, including any advice for Kiana or anyone else, leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839. You can also email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. We'll air our favorite comments and tips on a future episode, and stay tuned to the end of this episode for this week's listener comments and tips. James, it's my favorite part of the show where people call in and they give us their, their comments and tips and we get to steal them and reappropriate them as our own <laughs> advice later on. We quote them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Uh, Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for our lightning round where we answer questions from social media. Indeed we do. So James, uh, we're on uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram at The Minimalists and during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I each do our best to answer every question with just a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. Um, now yeah. we do pontificate for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 <laughs> we maunder on. We we, we, we build then, up the se- the the, yeah. the sediment, and then we we, we triangulate your way to a yep. tight response. And then uh, podcast eventually. Sean will tweeze out the most perfect line. Yeah, and put it good. in the show notes. And sometimes I just pick out a bunch of words out of random order and create something beautiful. We we call them minimal <laughs> maxims, and you can find all of our minimal maxims in one place. Thanks to our good friend Jessica and Williams over at minimalmaxims.com. It's all our pith- pithy answers from the minimalists. What's our first question, Ryan? Our first question is from Herb. Herb writes in, I have ideas in my head of so many good healthy habits that I have researched thoroughly and want to implement in daily life that will make me healthier and happier. But I never get around to starting. Do you have any tips on how to snap out of it and just get started? Well, my my um, I, I alluded to this already, but my my pithy answer to this. See, I had a, a, a head start. I already knew what the question was, James. <laughs> um, my my pithy answer is sub, subtract. Uh, subtraction is greater than addition, mm. and. Uh, uh, really, the thing is, like I talked about my morning routine, where I had all of these these sort of things that were in the way, right? And 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 they prevented me from doing my habit, the habit I wanted to, to call it. Because I, in, in truth, I had all these other sort of ancillary habits. Like I have to do the dishes first thing in the morning. I have to do this. I, and and they, weren't, they weren't leading me to the person I wanted to be. They were actually habits that were getting in the way of the habit that I wanted to, to truly develop. And so I think with, with Herb, one of the things that he's talking about here is I have so many habits that I want to start, right? Uh, I, have, I have ideas in my head of so many good, healthy habits that I've researched thoroughly. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm Herb. I'm the one that wrote in about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is your ghost account? Yes. You're like Kevin Durant here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're also the one who's giving me shit on Twitter all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so so w- what do you say, James? He, he has ideas for all these good habits. He has thoroughly researched. How does, he, how does he get started with implementing all of them immediately in his life? Yeah, well, we talked about one of them already, two-minute rule. So Mm -hmm. take the habit and downscale it so that it fits into two minutes or less. Mm -hmm. So that's first idea. Um, Second thing is don't worry about doing them all at once, right? Like time is going to pass anyway. Mm -hmm. So you might as well focus on mastering one of them, get it, make it your new normal, make it the standard in your life. And then you can add the next one, you know, a month or two or three from now. Mm -hmm. And the next year is going to pass regardless. So if you get to the end of the next year and you've mastered three or four or five, that's great. Um, But you don't need to do all five at once. It's way better than continuing to thoroughly research the habits. Correct. Right. And let's say you got five things on your list and at the end of the year, 
you can look at one of them and say, oh man, I really was able to, I mean, you, you feel so much better. Yeah, it's got to feel great, to yeah. have it, right? Like you're uh, undeniably better off than you were before. Absolutely. Um, so uh, so two minute rule, uh, focus on one at a time. And then the final thing that I'll add, which can be very useful uh, and echoes back to some of the things we talked about before. A lot of people wake up each day and think they need more motivation when what they really need is clarity. Mm. Uh, and what I mean is that we start each day and we don't necessarily have these basic details figured out about our habits. Like when and where are you going to write? You know, mm -hmm. okay, you want to build a habit of writing? What time will you do it? Where will you do it? Is it going to be at home? Is it going to be somewhere else? Or like you want to go to the gym? Great. You know, are you going to uh, work out at a home gym or are you going to uh, join another gym and have to drive there? If you're going to drive, are you going to like go before work or after work? Do you need to bring your own water bottle or is there a water fountain at the gym? And like all of that, those like little logistical details, they sound like not much. But when you are trying to build something new, that falling into a pattern where it's like, oh, you know, I always go to the gym and I forget my water bottle and they don't have a water fountain there. That's enough to get someone to quit early on. Yeah. And so. Uh, be very clear and specific. You can literally fill out a sentence that says like, I will exercise on this day at this time in this place. Mm -hmm. And there are over a hundred research studies that show, despite that sounding basic, that people are much more likely to follow through on their habits if they write down when and where they're going to occur. Yeah, I think about our friend Rob Bell, who um, was so inundated with like meetings and all these other things that were going on at at, at, well, at his place of work, at the church that he was running, and uh, in in Grand Rapids, that he rented a, a little office space, probably similar to this this room that we're we're sitting in here because he needed a place to go by himself for two hours a day and write. Yeah. And that, that's all it was. It was a desk and a chair. It was a writing office. Yeah. He went there and no one else was welcome. Yeah. And he excluded everyone for those two hours so he could go sit there and, and write. And he picked a time. He knew when he was going to go there every day. And also, the the and maybe this extends to that the, the habit thing. He And it's a Hemingway thing too. Like you always, you, you stop in mid-sentence sort of thing. Or for him, it was like, my two hours are up, even though this is going going really well I'm mm -hmm. going to stop right now so I have somewhere to pick back up um, when I start writing tomorrow and, and as opposed to like emptying the gas tank and burning yourself out I'm going to write for 14 hours today and then tomorrow you're like oh crap I can't top that I might as well stop well yeah. think about how different that experience is too because he finished every writing block there and he he wanted to stay he wanted to it was going well he's like oh, I wish I could be here longer mm -hmm. and so then he thinks back to like going to that place and it's like yeah I want to get back there every time I'm there I feel like the time goes too fast yeah. Yeah. and that's why I think Sometimes it can be very useful to scale your habits down so that you stop before it gets difficult. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a, it's exactly what you should do, should do in the long run, mm -hmm. but it's great in the short term. You know, like journaling. Stop journaling before it gets hard, before it feels like a hassle. Exercise. Do something that feels easy in the beginning. Make it like so easy that you can't say no to it, where you're like, oh, I just want to keep doing this. And then you like start to associate some positive feelings with that habit, and that makes you want to come back. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, no. I, yeah, I was just going to say one of the things that stood out to me, not only what you were talking about with Rob Bell, Josh, with kind of stepping outside of your normal environment, because in your book, you talk about how, you know, if you want to sit down in your living room and start writing, well, where you where your living room is used for, it's used for watching TV. Maybe it's used for listening to music. Maybe that's where you play board, board games. Whatever it is, it's, that's a, the family room. Right. It's like to then also add in writing with that room, um, that is uh, that can be a detriment. So stepping outside of your environment, I think, is a, is a great point. But the other thing, too, man, that really stood out to me in your book was the pointing and calling. Oh yeah. So like this is this is a concept that uh, James talks about. Actually, I'm going to do a bad job paraphrasing and just talk about what they do in Tokyo with sure. the pointing yeah. and calling. Yeah. So so I um, if you go to Tokyo, if you Japan has one of the best train systems in the world, and uh, I actually was in Tokyo earlier this year and. I saw, uh, or I guess I should say last year. How was I there earlier this year on January 1st? Um, <laughs> <coughs> so anyway, they, uh, they have this system that they refer to as pointing and calling. Um, and the basic idea is when the train pulls into the station, uh, you'll see the conductor will like point at the signal and say signal is green. Or they'll point at the speedometer and they'll say speed is 60 kilometers an hour. Or out on the platform, there will be other employees that point up and down and say like, you know, platform is clear. And uh, this system, the safety system that the Japanese designed, it basically engages multiple senses, right? Like you're saying it, you're pointing it out, you are seeing it as well. And so it, when you do something every day, like a conductor pulling into a station or uh, an employee like helping another train leave from the platform, and we do this, we all do this, 
when you do something over and over again, you start to get a little numb to it. It just becomes, you know, boring. It mm. becomes a habitual and you start to, when you can do it good enough on autopilot, it's easy to overlook your mistakes. Yeah. It's easy to not try to find a quest to do it better. And so pointing and calling raises that level of awareness to a more conscious level and you identify mistakes. And as luck or bad luck, I guess in this case would have it, I actually saw the system save a woman's life while I was in Tokyo. So we were on the platform and this family came up and they had, I think, four sons. The youngest one was probably like six or seven years old. And they got on the platform and he just walked onto the train because he thought, oh, we're up on the train platform. This is where we're going. But actually, they were waiting for the next one. And so he accidentally gets on the train. The doors close and his mom sees him on there. And so she runs over and sticks her arm in. And she thinks it's going to be like, you know, the elevator doors where like it closes and then they open back up. Yeah. Um, but actually, it trapped her arm in the door. <laughs> and so her she's in there holding her son he's like crying at this point mm. and the train which is one of the shinkansens the bullet trains that go like 200 miles an hour is about to take off and um there was an employee on the platform who did the pointing and calling that looked up and down and noticed like platform is not clear mm -hmm. and was able within like three seconds to radio the conductor and stop it. And the train stayed there. They opened the doors, they got the kid out and then a minute later it left. Oh and um, it's just a good example of, a system like that can make you more aware of the things that you do habitually yeah. and help you notice mistakes, errors, things that are not quite right. And um, when you pay attention like that, it becomes easier to spot those mistakes and correct them. Yeah. Well, I was the reason why I bring that up is because with starting habits, I mean, sometimes first you got to realize the habits that you already have. Right. And, uh, you know, what, what you talk about in your book is like list out all the habits you already have. I wake up in the morning, I brush my teeth, I make my coffee, I unplug the toaster. You know, these are the habits that we all already do. Put next to each habit, like is this a positive? Is this a negative? Or, or maybe it's ambivalent. You know, uh, uh, brushing your teeth, I guess, would be positive. Waking up is kind of ambivalent. Like, you're going to wake up no matter what. I'm pretty so. happy that I woke up today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Although I can't say I'd be sad if I didn't wake up. I just wouldn't know. <laughs> right, you just wouldn't know. <laughs> but, but, you know, and, and then going through that list, but then also as you're going through your habits, pointing and calling, like, I'm getting ready to eat this donut. And this donut is a negative impact on my life. Yeah. And go ahead and eat the donut. But if you are calling it out, and it's it's different too, I feel, than just thinking it. Mm. Saying it out loud or writing it down makes it much more, it just makes it more real. It makes it sink in a little bit more. And if you're calling that out every single morning, eventually you're going to get tired of hearing yourself treating your body so poorly. Right. There's going to be something that clicks to uh, to hopefully initiate you know, some kind of different habit or some kind of change. I know for me, the, the, the habits I have now, I've had a lot of health problems the last two and a half, three years. Um, some pretty significant health problems. I'm, I'm dealing with uh, a SIBO bacterial overgrowth in, in my small intestine right now. And it is agony is the word that I realized that I've been going through the last three months. And um, I can tell you one thing that keeps me sane at this point is uh, the certain habits that I have, even when I don't feel like oh, I, I can't do this, like I'll, I'll show up for it. Even if like writing yesterday as an example, like I sat down to write and like I was in pain from, from everything that's gone. I just couldn't do it, but I, I at least I showed up. Right. And, and for me, because I've been showing up for so long, um, I, I know that like that is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, for me, it, it, it keeps me saying still still exercising. Maybe I can't do what I was doing because I just don't have the energy to do it. But showing up to do something is better than just throwing my hands up and saying, well, I guess yeah. I'm, I'm dead to the world. Dude, this I was, is why I like to say, like, you know, even if you say you have a crazy day and you travel and you're on the plane for five hours or whatever, and then you get to your hotel and all you can do is five push ups before you like collapse on the bed. Yeah. But at least you were the type of person who didn't miss workouts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like that, it doesn't sound like much on any given day, but it counts for a lot in the long run because you have this story in your head now where it's like, I don't feel good. The situation was not optimal. It wasn't my best day, mm -hmm. but I still was able to show up. Yeah. Uh, yesterday I had a horrible day working out. Like I would the, like, you know, just second set in. I'm like, I'm not getting as many reps as I usually get in. It was it was later in the day. I typically Were you work out earlier. Kilograms again? <laughs> <laughs> I have done that before. Like, why is this twenty pounds so heavy? We were in Australia, <laughs> <laughs> and Ryan was like, "I can barely bench press 150 pounds." <laughs> and Josh is like, "You're bench pressing almost 300 pounds, dude." 
<laughs> the weights are a lot heavier down yeah here. like man it's crazy i didn't Hasn't, realize the toilets swirl the wrong direction oh and goodness. everything what, what's your pithy answer ryan yeah so so my pithy answer is this start small with a new habit even if you start with a small failure so going back to working out like i i did for all intents and purposes i failed yesterday like it was not an awesome workout but even even at its worst it's still better than doing nothing even fail even you know f- uh, trying and then not getting a hundred percent result that i expected and, and failing somewhat uh i would much rather be in that position than than doing nothing at all all right the next question is from jamie how do you break the habit of never saying no reminds me of the the, the byline for the uh, that pop star movie never stop never stopping <laughs> 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 Uh, in fact, I stole that for an essay uh, that we have about um, Screenless Saturdays. We do this thing called Screenless Saturdays every Saturday, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But um, and because that, that's kind of what it feels like with social media is like I can never stop. Like we don't even live in a 24 hour news cycle anymore. It's like an every hour, every 15 minute news cycle. And it's like, hey, man, you didn't hear about what uh, the president did or the blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, I didn't hear about it. Yeah, man, it was 17 minutes ago. And you're like, uh, yeah, I'm not caught up. I'm sorry. Uh, and so. So I think uh, Jamie's question is, is, is especially relevant today because we're saying yes to almost everything. And so my, my short answer here is, and I'd love to hear what, what your take is on this, James. Uh, my short answer to Jamie's question, Jamie is asking, how do you break the habit of never saying no? Um, whenever you say yes to something unimportant, you're saying no to something important. And uh, I, I call this yes-itis. Like we're, we're always saying yes because we, do, we feel bad when someone asks us to do something, even if it's someone we don't know. It's someone on Twitter or, or Instagram or you know, whatever. It's a, a distant Facebook friend who you remember a little bit from high school, but you're not really sure when the last time you saw them was. They ask you for something. It's our, because we are wired to be around, you know, 40 plus or so people, someone says, ask you something you're you're wired to say yes because you want to build that that tribe but now we we we're we are faced with unlimited numbers of input and these unlimited numbers of discrete bits of input we feel like we have to say yes to each of them not realizing as i say yes to this bad habit i say yes to this bad habit yes to this one each one individually isn't that bad but when you add them all up i've 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 said yes to a bunch of unimportant things and it's forcing me to say no to the things that are most important to me yeah yeah i mean yes is a form of time debt no is a form of like time option Mm. right like if you say no to something you still have the freedom to do whatever you want with that block of time if you say yes to that podcast sean (laughs) that's that's pithy if you say yes to it then you can only use that block of time for that one thing right um and so i sometimes i like to say like um no is a choice or no is a decision Mm -hmm. yes is a responsibility Right. Mm. Because like as soon as you've said yes to something, you're responsible for showing up and doing that thing for that block of time. Yeah. Um, but the question that I would ask myself if I was dealing with that. And pr- honestly, I am dealing with this a lot right now. You know, like Atomic Habits has done very well to all the bestseller list done, you know, it's the launch is incredible, whatever. And we had to say yes to a lot of things mm-hmm. didn't make all that happen. Right. But now we're on the other side of it. And we've had all these things coming in and now I need to like switch and start learning to say no to stuff and like be careful about prioritizing time and things. And that's a good problem to have, but I think the the lesson I, that I'm coming to realize is it depends on what season you're in in your life. So the, the question to ask is like, what season am I in right now? So like for me, in a broad sense, this period of my life is a very career heavy season. I don't have kids yet. I'm very focused on my personal health and my career and so on. But at some point I'll have kids and that will signal a shift to a new season. And so when I'm in a new season, my habits seem to shift as well. And, um, so I think that there's a place for yes, but it's not in perpetuity, mm-hmm. right? It's not, it's not, it's needs to be like a careful, um, a carefully well-defined season. You know, it's, uh, yeah. we, we talked about this. We did a podcast with Jordan Harbinger uh, a couple weeks ago on business. And one of the things in business that I realized when we first started eight years ago, my pithy answer to that question was say yes until you have to say no and then say no until you have to say yes. 
<laughs> and because uh, so for us, like when you like, so the book launched a, g- a good example of that, right? So so you said yes, 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 because you wanted this thing to uh, reach the people it needed to reach, and in order to do that, you had to pick the appropriate channels that were willing to act as a megaphone to to get this message out there, right? And so not only were you tapping into your own existing audience at, at JamesClear.com, but but you were going out to these other media outlets, etc., and and uh, and you using their platform to explain why it's important for people to take a look at their habits. And, and so you're saying yes to all of these things. At the same time, y- y- at some point, it's going to become overwhelming. You can't do that in perpetuity. So when Ryan and I first started The Minimalist, we just said yes to everything. Yeah, you had CBS wants us to come out. We'll fly to New York and do that. Or yes, the the, the Today Show wants to come out. We'll do that. Uh, in fact, this year, the Today, Today Show asked us to come out. I said, no, but you can come here, right? And so like it was it was about making a uh, a change. It was uh, sometimes it's a no, but mm-hmm. we can we can do this. Sometimes it's just a hard no, like no. And so whenever I say no to someone, and I think this will be helpful for Jamie, I tell them what I'm saying yes to. Mm-hmm. And so um, I got a request to be on someone's podcast this morning, a friend of ours actually, and I'm going to say no to it. Um, and the reason I'm going to say no to it is so I can spend time with my family, like legitimately, not the uh, pol- the politicians I'm quitting to spend time with my family. Um, <laughs> but but like like legitimately, like I, if I say yes to this, I'm going to have to say no to spending this hour or two hours with Bex. Yeah, and that's a good practice to like clarify why you're doing that. Add, yeah, adding clarity is, is is important because it's not just saying, hey, it's not it's not you. It's just like I have only so many hours in the day and here's how I'm going to spend those hours. I would rather do this. Thank you for understanding is always the thing that I'll I think say. it's important too. like even in those uh, moments where the seasons where you are saying yes to a lot of things like my book launch, for example, um, I was still saying no to like almost everything else, right? Like I was saying no yeah. to learning a musical instrument, even though I think that would be cool, but mm-hmm. like this isn't the right season for that. Or right. I was saying no to cooking classes, even though it'd be great to be a better cook or in like a million other things. Sure. It was just yes, but in a very narrowly defined area. Right. Yeah. I, I think that, that we don't realize that because it's not, we're, we're, we're ultimately saying no to virtually everything anyway. Right. Right. Yeah. The instrument thing is, is really good because if, if someone were to come to you and say, Ryan, I need you to learn how to play flute. <laughs> you, you're pretty easily going to say no to that because right. of the time commitment and your lack of interest, et cetera. But when someone comes to you with a small ass, like, it'll just take an hour of your time. And it's like, oh, it's just an hour of my time. Mm. Yeah. But it's also an hour of your time you're never going to get back. Yeah, and it adds up. It absolutely does. Do you have a pithy answer for I us, do. I got a couple pithy answers. One thing that um, you talked about in your book, man, is how you, know, you said maybe it's not... Maybe it's not uh, impossible, but you've never really have known someone to stick with a good habit in a toxic mm. environment. So, I've like, I've seen someone stick to positive habits in a negative environment. Yeah. So, so I mean, if I was to like just paraphrase that, I'd say you can't stick to good habits. Yeah, in a toxic environment. So, first and foremost, like Jamie, you've got to make sure that you are surrounding yourself with people who who want to see you empower yourself, who, when you say no, they support you. If you're around a bunch of people who expect all of these things out of you and then you say no, and then they start to bring you down or or whatever it may be, it's going to be very, very hard for you to get into the habit of saying no uh, if you are surrounded by toxic people essentially yeah and you're, because you're saying you're, you're saying yes to all of these things it's like you're you're in a hamster wheel man and you're not actually going anywhere um you're constantly fighting off the sort of bad habits of other people yeah and then the other thing i would say too and this is with any habit it's uh, and we talked about this earlier find ways to make bad habits immediately unpleasurable and learn how to appreciate the long-term rewards so what i mean by that is is that when you say yes jamie and you know you shouldn't have said yes, like you are going to have that immediate pain of like, oh, I just overcommitted. But how else can you really associate saying yes uh, with an unpleasurable feeling? And then, you know, conversely, like when you say no, how can you really bring in that that long-term reward and, and look forward to that? Um, I, of, I, of the good habits. Yes, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, yeah, I think that that's an important distinction to make because – Habits, as you mentioned early on, they're not automatically good or bad. A habit is, is simply a habit. And also the meaning that we give to the thing, like a good habit for one person might be a bad habit for someone else, mm-hmm. right? And I think we have to keep that in mind. Uh, P.S. Ryan, we have three more questions oh, here nice. today. Also, I want to talk to James. I, you don't have kids, so I find people who don't have kids are the best people to talk about 
Uh, I love giving advice them. on kids. I don't have any kids. I've got the best well, advice. Giving advice on Let me tell I you what I do with your about. stupid kids. <laughs> well, I do want to talk to you about building habits with kids because Ella is at an age now. She's in kindergarten and uh, she's picking up not just her own habits, but the habits from the kids around her, the peers. She is, she is like ultra impressionable right now. Yep. And I find that she's even picking up habits from like YouTube, you know, because mm. kids love watching YouTube now. So, so I don't know. Like, you know how everyone starts their damn YouTube video with hey guys so now it's ella or an other kid saying hey guys like just starting out sentences hey guys dude i heard about this kid uh (laughs) was was getting put to bed and they told they're they're like two or three years old and they told their mom please like and subscribe (laughs) (laughs) like that is how that is how they learn to say goodbye (laughs) all right so so i I, want to talk to you about kids habits but then i also want to answer bernie's question about foundational habits bernie says are there any foundational habits that one should implement first that will help with all subsequent habits and then aditha asks i tend to give up if i quote fail or quote cheat on a habit how do you handle the frustration of when the habitual streak is broken and then finally fira asks what is the most simple yet life-changing habit you have? And if you, you all would like to hear our answers to those questions, then you can listen to this week's Postscript episode over at the Minimalist Private Podcast. That's right. Every week, we record an additional podcast episode. This week, we'll have James Clear on there. And it's available exclusively to our Patreon subscribers. So if you want to support our show and keep this podcast 100% advertisement-free, then head on over to theminimalists.com slash support. Please like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> too good uh, no that no no awesome. so um in addition to our weekly postscript episodes the minimalist private podcast feed includes our ask the minimalist anything episodes we do one of those uh, every month also unreleased recordings of our live events last year we did i think 15 live events that we released on our uh, patreon feed just for our patreon subscribers and also the entire back catalog of past private episodes we're approaching a hundred private podcast episodes wow. over there on patreon so once you become a subscriber, you'll also receive a personal link to our private podcast feed so that it plays in your normal podcast player, whatever you're using to listen to this podcast right now. Our private podcast will also play there. It's just a separate feed just for our Patreon subscribers. Find all the details and all the good stuff, including an additional podcast episode every week over at theminimalists.com slash support. And by the way... Um, I heard Sam Harris, uh, you all know Sam Harris maybe from our documentary or from many of his books uh, that he's written. Uh, He has a great podcast called The Waking Up Podcast. And he he was telling people about, because he doesn't do ads on his podcast either. Mm -hmm. And um, he was talking about like, I know some of you subscribe to this because I provide you with like this, these bonus episodes and like ask Sam anything or he goes, and it's great if you want to support me for that, but that's not the reason you should support my show support it because it's important and I think it's helping other people and I don't want to have to do advertisements. And so I would just like to echo that sentiment. Like if you want to, if you want to keep getting this, this for free because you can't afford to support our podcast and you'll keep getting it for free. We're doing our best to do this without advertisements, but we pay Sean, we pay Jordan, we pay for a studio space. Ryan and I literally make $0 off this podcast. All of you, I would like to make some money from Patreon eventually someday, (laughs) but we're using it right now to, to pay the people we need to pay. And, Support it because you think it's important. If you think the show is important and you're willing to support us, just a couple dollars makes a huge difference. Theminimalists.com slash support. And plus you do get a bunch of good stuff as well. But that shouldn't be the reason. That should be a nice little bonus for you. So here is a snippet from this week's Postscript episode. The lesson here for parents is that you still have a strong influence, but one of the best levers that you can pull for influencing the habits of your kids is the type of environment that you place them in, the type of peers you put them around. Because you have control over what city you live in, what schools they go to, what extracurriculars you expose them to. I think back to like, I played baseball, but I also swam. Every swimming team I was on, all the kids on those teams were smart. It's like, if you look at the swimming team at at my college, they have the highest GPA. It was like swimming and cross country every year crushed it. If you want your kids to have good study habits, that's one example of like, it doesn't guarantee it, but place them in an environment where that's what their friends are going to be doing. Because when habits allow you to fit in, when they're the type of thing your friends are doing anyway, they naturally become more attractive. Mm. And it's much more attractive for them to be like, oh, all my friends act this way too, than it is for you to be like, you should be doing this. Okay, now it's time for our added value portion of the show. It's where we talk about something that has added value to our lives recently. Ryan, I'm going to start. 
Um, we, just, we just ended a year, and it was one of the best years for music that I can remember in a long time, which is actually hard to believe because music has become so ephemeral now. There's, hmm. there's hardly, you know, we don't, it's not the same experience. I used to go to the CD store in and, and Middletown, Ohio, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's where Ryan and I used to go. So what was it, CD Connection? Yeah, we go to CD Connection <laughs> in Middletown. So, so James is from Butler County, so uh, he gets the Middletown reference. Um, and, uh, and I remember, like, there, it wasn't ephemeral. It was like, it was a whole experience, like getting dropped off, listening to the CDs and like it. And now it's just like, oh, there's 17 new albums that came out on Friday that I want to listen to. I can't listen to all of them, especially since I'm listening to all these damn podcasts. Like we're, we're inundated. It's, it's the beauty of, of the, the removal of all the gatekeepers. But at the same time, we're flooded with, with content, which is not a word that Ryan and I are, are, are fans of um, because there's so a lot of content out there is not a whole lot of meaningful creations so surprisingly there were a, a lot of amazing albums in uh 2018 yeah it's been a good year and so at the end of every year and i've done this every year since we started the minimalists uh I, I do my top 10 or top 12 albums of the year and uh, i've been working on it this past weekend so hopefully by the time this episode's out it's done What's i have number one so far uh phoebe bridgers Oh, I have not listened to that yet. You saw her in concert, though. She I opened did. up for the National. Yeah, um, it was she, great. Her, great opener. Yeah, it was. She her album is like, um, I don't know, beautiful songs about sadness, um, <laughs> and uh, but it's like it's like L A angst in a way because she's from L A. Mm. And but um, L A angst. <laughs> I've never heard that before, but that resonates so well with me. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a great album. She also did this... Uh, That's a great album title, L.A. Angst. <laughs> <laughs> seems like it'd be a Phoebe Bridgers album title. Um, she did this trio with two other uh, female singer-songwriters. Uh, the, the trio is called Boy Genius, and it is really good, too. It's like an EP. Uh, it'll definitely be on my list or at least be on the honorable mentions uh, because I, I don't even know what an album is anymore either. Like Kanye West did the whole seven-song thing yeah. for, for a whole month this year. They had a bunch of albums that were seven songs. That used to be an EP. So anyway... Uh, if you are a fan of all kinds of strange, eclectic music, there's everything from a pseudo country album in uh, Rustin Kelly's album, which is definitely my top five albums of the year. It, it's uh, it's it's like country without the twang. It would be like L.A. country music, even though he's from Nashville, I think. Um, it's it, it's just beautiful songwriting. Uh, it bridges the gap between singer, songwriter, and country to, um, I mean, great, like, down south rap albums like uh, uh, NBA Youngboy. It was, like, my favorite rap album of the year. And so there is everything in between Phoebe Bridgers, uh, Matt Nathanson, and uh, that whole list you can find at theminimalists.com slash sound. It's uh, The essay there is called The Sound of Euphony. Nice. Dude, I... I'm going to recommend, I know this seems kind of lame, but it's really, really awesome, actually. <laughs> so Mariah and I, we we've, we always have the different shows in common and we'll binge on stuff or like, you know, if we're going to sit down and watch something on Netflix, we'll usually watch like The Office or Seinfeld or something that we have both seen a million times and like we can sit there and laugh. And it's, dude, what's funny when Mariah and I watch like The Office, for example, we are constantly repeating lines back and forth to each other. It's like, such I, a good show. It's 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 hilarious. But uh, she had never seen Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. so I was like, you know what? Because I had I had actually got the uh, you know the HBO app to watch that special, the comedy special that you recommended. Oh, dude, I forget I forget his name. Drew Michael. Yeah, the Drew Michael comedy special, which in its own right, like I will recommend that that we've already recommended on the show. But that's an amazing. Have we really? I think we have recommended okay, that. Yeah, it's great. But it's it's a great comedy special. Um, and it's also it's a comedy special where the dude had no audience, which he, was he filmed it without an audience. It was incredible. It's just incredible. But. But since since I had got that to watch that special, yeah. I was like, man, Game of Thrones is on here. I'm like, Mariah, let's start watching Game of Thrones. And dude, watching now her... She had never seen it. She had never seen it. Watching... But you had. Her, yes. And watching her watch it is like, it's its own thrilling experience. You know what that reminds me of? So, so we had... 
Peter Rollins on the podcast to do an episode about love. And on his podcast, which is called The Fundamentalists, he and his roommate comedian friend, they, they were talking about how one of the best reasons to have kids is so you can re-experience cr- the, the belief in Santa Claus. Mm. <laughs> now, I don't actually propagate the belief of, of like there is some man who's going to break into our house once a year and leave behind material trinkets that I didn't want him to leave behind anyway. But it's fun to get in the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> but Ella seems to believe in Santa Claus no matter how much I tell her he doesn't exist. Dude, she saw him at the mall. <laughs> yeah, she did. Um, and, uh, and so... And she'll ask her mom like certain questions like, doesn't, why does he get stuck in the chimney? And, and at this point, Bax is just like, I don't know. Why, why do you think he doesn't get stuck in the chimney? She's like, I think he uses the front door. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, but you get to like re-experience your, almost your childhood in a way by, by, by having a child who is experiencing those emotions for the first time and you're doing the same thing with game of thrones yes it's it's pretty awesome so i i would recommend like just if you've got someone that you can you know binge watch some tv with like go to one of those shows that they've never seen that you love and like just watch their reaction to it game of thrones specifically though because of the way that that show plays out mm. Uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of a spoiler alert here. It's like... They all die. Y- well, pretty much, dude. It's <laughs> like watching watching her fall in love with these characters the same way I did. And, I'm, and I want to be like, don't fall too much in love. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I feel about Santa Claus. Like, you're going to be devastated. That's why from the beginning, I try to tell Ella, like, it's a fun story. It's made up. Just like the, her, the cartoon she watches with Daniel Tiger and Peppa Pig. They're made up as well. They're not real you know, uh, and she understands that, but she for some re- for some reason thinks Santa Claus is real, and I don't I don't want to spoil it for her. But <laughs> at the same time, I kind of do want to spoil it for her. Oh, dude, that's that's hilarious. Man. James, has anything been adding value to your life recently? Oh man, so many things. All right, so I have a couple. Um, so sticking with the habits theme, uh, there are two Chrome extensions that I've used this entire year that I have loved. So one is called uh, Facebook Newsfeed Eradicator which you just add it to your Chrome browser and you can log into Facebook. You can use it and check your friend's profile if you want, but there is no news feed. It's completely uh, blocked. So you don't see any posts. Um, and then the second one is called distraction for YouTube. Uh, and so you, another this. Chrome extension, you add it to the browser and you can click on a link and watch a YouTube video, but all of the suggested videos in the sidebar are blocked. So you oh, don't see that anything. Is awesome. So it's just like a blank screen with the, the the video so there there is there is no like all right i'm just gonna watch this one more video right. well that's like <laughs> tim urban has that joke where he's like you know you go to watch a youtube video and then 20 minutes later you're watching a interview with justin bieber's mom and you're like how did i get here right. you know, it's like, <laughs> no, for me it's eight hours later i'm drooling on myself yeah. Post, <laughs> postmates is bringing their second order yeah, right <laughs> um podcast sean can you put a link to all all the things we mentioned in the show notes uh uh today i would appreciate it let's move on to right here right now so we talk about what's going on in the lives of the minimalists so uh one thing that we've been doing for the last three months is something called screenless saturdays and it's uh because you know we, we've done different experiments experiments in the past where we've gotten off social media for a month or we you know like i told you earlier i got rid of my cell phone for a few months whatever and, and we said well what's a what's a smaller increment in which we can uh, learn we can temporarily deprive ourselves for a day to see what we learn from the whole process so there's there's three ways to do screenless saturday and for those of you who want to take a, uh, a look at it it's uh, just the minimalists.com slash screenless but the first way is just uh, like a social media fast so you don't you're not really screenless you're just saying i'm gonna stay off social media all day on saturday uh, because we're constantly b- bombarded, right? We never stop, never stopping with social media. And it, quite often, it's the first thing we reach for in the morning. It's like, oh, I've just got to check Twitter, Instagram real quick and like a bunch of pictures that I didn't know existed 30 seconds ago. Uh, and so that's the first way to participate in Screenless Saturday. It's just get, get off social media for one day. Uh, the second way to participate is get off your computer too. So no computer and no social media. Uh, we call that one, what do you call that one? Digital downtime. And then the third way is truly screenless. You go all the way in. No screens all day on Saturday. No TV, no phone. No screened in porch. <laughs> no screens I love it. anywhere. <laughs> He's definitely from the Midwest. Screened in porches. Yeah. Uh, and so the first screenless Saturday Mariah and I did, I was like, man, what are we going to go do? I'm like, well, we don't have, let's go walk and see a movie. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan had to get out puppets and right. reenact. Uh, Jaws. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> she had to be caught up on the first one, though. 
Uh, yeah. So, you know, it, it's, I learned a lot that first Saturday because like I went to go to the car and so Bex and I just go out and we explore for the day and like we go get lost together. Like that's sort of the intention, like, cause we don't have a GPS. Um, and we just go out and we don't, I don't have my phone with me. And so we'll, but it's a great way to learn a city too. Cause we've only lived in LA for a year. And so you get so reliant on the device. It shows you everywhere where, where to go, right? And so, like, if you need to go somewhere, you're like, I just go where the stupid thing tells me to go. Right. I'll drive into the lake if it tells me to do that. <laughs> uh, that's why you don't use Apple Maps, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, it has tried to drive me into a body of water more than once. Oh, my goodness. Uh, serious. And, uh, and so, although I hear it's much better these days. Uh, and anyway, like, uh, we just go and we get lost together. But we also, like, we went to a CD store for the first time. Like, they still exist. There's one in Hollywood where uh, it's called Amoeba. It's this giant. It's like the, the last bastion. Uh, it's the last stronghold of, of physical media. And, <laughs> all the uh, CD connections like combined. Yeah, I think all the <laughs> CDs all consolidated, that were left. yeah. <laughs> and we bought like two or three CDs uh, and we like listened to them in the car. But I realized I was just renting the CDs because I wasn't going to use them that long. One of the CDs I got was a dollar. And I'm like, well, I'll just return this next weekend and like get 50 cents back for it or whatever. And then if I want to buy something else, I'm essentially just renting CDs for a day because uh, I'm not going to hold on to them. But this this moment of temporary depriva- deprivation, the, the whole point is like, let's pause for a day at the end of the day on Saturday. Think about what was different. Write down like, how did you feel? Did it feel less chaotic? What did you go without? And some some Saturdays you might just, I'm just going to go without social media. I know Bex did that last Saturday. And then last Saturday, we, the four of us uh, besides James who were in this room, so podcast Sean and Jordan and Ryan and I, on Saturday, we did two things. One is I uh, Bex wasn't in town, neither was Ella. So uh, we spent about three hours searching for a payphone. Turns out <laughs> payphones don't exist anymore. Oh my! And we found one finally. And then it was not there. It was like just a shell of the, you know, the, there was no phone in it. It was just the payphone booth. Yeah. Uh, and I realized that Superman would have nowhere to change these days. <laughs> he would be really screwed. And Neo would totally be screwed. Oh, yeah. He would not be able to get out of the Matrix. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and and so, like, we started going around and just, like, asking people at different coffee shops. Ryan was hanging out the window. Where's a payphone? <laughs> and we spent, like, three hours searching for a payphone. And then we went over to, what is it, Franklin Canyon? Yeah, Franklin Canyon uh, Park. And uh, is that a Super 8? Yeah. See if I can, I can put this up. So Jordan has this old Super 8 camera that takes film. It's a relic, man. Yeah, it, it, like, you can this only like have... an original Super 8. If you do 18 frames per second, you can film for nine minutes with this thing. <laughs> so we filmed a, a, a video about screenless Saturdays. And uh, it was... And we use... Uh, Sean has this old, like, $20 cassette tape recorder so we went fully analog on screenless saturday i wish we had that to show because like we jordan was filming with that and podcast if you're watching this on youtube you can see the camera i'm holding yeah. up by the way yeah yeah and then yeah the, there will be a behind the scenes clip that uh jordan puts out uh, about how we filmed that but the craziest part was when we we're filming it i think was when sean had with his recorder had to like you know, hold <laughs> and just get perfectly out of the frame yeah, like, <laughs> this feels, for sound. This is like substantial, right? Oh yeah, it's, it's got hefty. good weight. It's actual metal, right? <clears throat> it's like yeah. I feel yeah. like you could just load a clip into this and hurt someone with it. <laughs> you don't want to do that, Jordan. Calm down. Oh man, um, it yeah. was a lot of fun. It yeah, it was. Fun. So we spent the day doing that, and then I shit you not, uh, and you'll see this in whatever video we end up putting out. We'll put a link to it in in the show notes. But at the very end, we f- we were driving out of Franklin Canyon. I'm getting ready to drive these guys home. And we drive past an actual payphone. In Beverly Hills. In Beverly Hills. <laughs> right. Where a payphone would be, right? <laughs> well, it's funny because I knew for a fact there was a payphone on Highland and uh, Franklin Avenue. Yeah. Um, but, in Hollywood. But uh, yeah. Josh refused to get dysentery. <laughs> 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 but that's where you expect payphones to be is like. Well, we, we found several payphones. We even found one that was still intact, but didn't work. Just didn't work, yeah. And then we found the one in Beverly Hills. And I was able to call, I was able to call uh, Bex. And then I talked to Ella on the phone. And um, Ella was so confused because she had never talked to me on the phone before I realized like she couldn't understand and she said why can't I see you right now <laughs> I said because I'm on a payphone she's like what's that <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the and, and so 
No, I'm not. Uh, we're not out here saying deprive yourself of technology. What we're saying is sometimes we can step back from technology to figure out how to use it more deliberately because sometimes these habits have just come into our life. Like, I'm going to get up and check Twitter. I'm going to get up and do this with my phone. I'm going to reach, reach, reach for my phone 60 times a day. And all of a sudden, it is a habit that is getting in the way of what we truly want. So check out the uh, the video we did about Screenless Saturday. Uh, you can find that in the show notes to this episode. Uh, before we move on to the rest of the right here right now stuff i just want to say thanks to james clear for joining us yeah, today man. and uh, if uh, you all are listening to this then i would encourage you to follow him he's at james clear on uh, twitter at james underscore clear on instagram and uh james clear on facebook as well jamesclear.com his book is called atomic habits you can check it out wherever you get books these days and um Oh, and you've got a Habits Academy course over at jamesclear.com as well. So if people need some help, additional help with uh, with getting their habits in shape, I think they can uh, check out the Hab- Habits Academy over at jamesclear.com. James, thank you so much for being with yeah, us man. today. Thanks oh, for making thanks, the trip guys. out, dude. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. It was great. And I, by the way, I need to ask you for a dollar um, because this is our last chance, Ryan. So <sighs> we're from a city called Dayton, Ohio. And uh, uh, James grew up in Hamilton, Ohio, which is right down the street from Dayton, Ohio. Um, and uh, he lives in Columbus now, so right down the street from Dayton, Ohio as well. Um, Ryan and I are, are well, the west side of Dayton, which we did not grow up on the west side of Dayton. Uh, but the west side of Dayton is one of the largest food deserts in the country. 40% of the population of, of Dayton proper lives on the west side of Dayton. And there is not a single grocery store on the entire west side of Dayton. So think about 40% of one of the largest cities in the United States does not have access to healthy food, right? They have access to convenience store food. They can get, you know, uh, uh, Cheetos and, and Doritos. Mac. Yeah, they can get a fat, fat, some fast food. Yeah, you can, you, they can get some fast food. Um, they can get liquor at the, at the local corner store. But they don't have access to vegetables. <laughs> I and tried that liquor diet. It is doesn't work real well. <laughs> <laughs> you look great, man. <laughs> um, speaking of bad habits, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, and we didn't even dive into all of our bad habits from our twenties. Right, that's a totally different episode. That was no. the addictions episode. <laughs> That'll be, uh, yeah, that, yeah, uh, we already exactly. did that one. No. Uh, yeah, so. Um, we're, what we're trying to do is uh, we, we did we did this thing over Christmas where people could buy a brick to help us build this grocery store. Um, we've we've raised close to a hundred thousand dollars, but we're not there yet. It's the last hundred thousand dollars we need to build this three million dollar grocery store on the west side of Dayton. It's called Jim City Market. We partner up with the folks at Jim City Market, and we're trying to raise the final hundred thousand dollars to to build this thing. And so. What we're looking for our audience to do is buy a brick for a friend or a family member on behalf of, or uh, on behalf of yourself even. So if you're interested in helping us contribute in a meaningful way, Ryan and I are donating $25,000 of our own money, buying 25,000 bricks. Yeah. You should see the other podcast room we have here. It's, <laughs> it's full got pallet, of bricks. pallets of bricks in there. <laughs> They're like, guys, we, we think you, you didn't understand the metaphor. <laughs> Although Ella, she she has been like we go out on walks together. She like is trying to pick up bricks and hand them to me now. Like this will help your grocery store. Oh, that's, that's adorable. <laughs> yeah, and and so if you want to help us out, uh, this is the last chance. So we could really use your help. We didn't make it to a hundred thousand dollars. This is an example of what you talked about earlier, Ryan, with failure. Like mm. we we failed. We didn't hit our hundred thousand mark by end of the year. Mm. But it's certainly a whole lot better us getting to like seventy thousand yeah. dollars than us getting to zero dollars, right? right? And so um, if you're listening to this and you want to help out. Donate a dollar or donate however much money you have. It'd be really helpful. Just go to theminimalists.com slash Dayton, and uh, that will get you over to the donation page for Jim City Market. You can get more information over there as well. Um, also on YouTube right now, besides our podcast, which you can comment on, if you want to comment on this episode, you can do so over at youtube.com slash The Minimalist. On our YouTube channel, you can find quickie episodes of The Minimalist Podcast. You can find living room conversations where Ryan and I sit down, answer one question at a time in our living room. Rooms. Also, house tours uh, of Ryan's and my places coming soon. Also, there is a new poll that we have up each week on YouTube. You could vote for which videos you would like to see next on our YouTube channel. And uh, we're doing something called Simple Sundays on our website and also in your email box. So if you if you want our new writings or any new show notes that come out for the podcast, just go to theminimalists.com and enter your email address at the top. We'll never send you junk or spam or advertisements because all of that stuff is gross. Ryan, what else you got for us? As usual, I just want to encourage people to read more and get informed. 
Oh, and here's some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. This is Emma from Adelaide in Australia. Now, I have a bit of encouragement for anyone who is struggling to get rid of books. I have worked in the book industry for over 10 years now, and needless to say, I had thousands. It was out of control. I recently started culling them. I didn't realise until then the amount of stress and overwhelm and anxiety they were causing just having them living in my house so I've started getting rid of them all I'm down to two bookshelves now and I want to get down to that hall of fame I just realized I wasn't going to read them and if I couldn't be bothered getting them from a library there was literally no point in me keeping them hi I wanted to call and say thank you for giving me and my family perspective on what really matters in life and as a payback, I'd like to share some information I recently came across that you may or may not know about. Ronnie Ware is an Australian nurse who spent a few years living with people on their deathbed, and she ultimately collected top five regrets of their life. I encourage you to look into it and share that information. It's really inspired me in recent weeks, and I hope it does the same for you. Hello, it's Catherine from Littleton. Um, I was just listening to the show on experiences, and I'm a 50-something divorcee who also had to part with a lot of things when she got divorced. And I wanted to let that lady know, and I can't remember her name, that it's okay. It's okay to let go, and it actually feels really good once you get through it, and you will survive, and you don't have to have all that stuff. And, yes, your kids will let you know what they want. So just let it go. Be free, live your life, start a new journey. All right, y'all, that's it for this episode. If you have a question for The Minimalist, give us a call, 406-219-7839. You can also email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. And if you leave here with just one message today, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. The Minimalists.